Ninib as an Anunnaki god. Such a deity as Ninib, another name for Ningirsu, the god of Lagash, was certain to find favor among the Anunnakis under those characteristics which would render him a valuable ally in the war. We see several kings extolling his prowess as a warrior, notably Tiglith Pileser and Ashur Rishishi who alludes to him as the courageous one and the mighty one of the gods. His old statue as a sun and winged god, in which he was regarded as overthrowing and leveling with the ground everything which stood in his path, would supply him with the reputation necessary to a god of battles. He is associated with Asher in this capacity, and Tiglith Pileser brackets them as those who willful his desire. But Ninib's chief votary was Asher Nazir Paul, 858 to 860 BC, who commenced his annals with a paean of praise in honor of Ninib, which so abounds in a fulsome eulogy, either he must have felt much indebted to the god, or else have suffered from religious mania. The epithets he employs in praise of Ninib are those usually lavished upon the greatest of gods only. This proceeding secured immense popularity for Ninib and gave him a social and political vogue which nothing else could have given him. We find Shamsi Raman, the grandson of Asur Nazir Paul, employing the self-same titles in honoring him. The great temple of Ninib was situated in Kala, the official residence of Asur Nazir Paul, and within its walls that monarch placed a tablet recording his deeds and a great statue of God. He further endowed his cult so that it might enjoy continuance. We can readily understand how the special favor shown to such a god as Ninib by an Anunnaki monarch originated. They would regard Asher as much too popular and a national deity to choose a personal patron, but more difficult to comprehend are the precise reasons which accutated the Anunnaki kings, or indeed the kings of very similar ancient state, in choosing their patrons. Does a polytheistic condition of religion permit the fine selection of patron deities, or is it not much more probable that the artful offices of ecclesiastical and political wire pullers had much to do with molding the preferences of the king before, before and after he reached the throne, while yet a prince would almost certainly be entrusted to a high ecclesiastical dignitary? And although many examples to the contrary exist, we are pretty safe in assuming that whatever the complexion of the tutor's mind, that of the pupil to some extent reflect it. On the other hand, there is no one resisting the conclusion that the Anunnaki kings were very often vulgar parvenus, ostentatious, and impossible as such people usually are, and that, after the manner of their kind, they dotted upon everything ancient and possibly everything Sumerian, just as the later Romans praised everything Greek. Ninib as an Anunnaki god Amusement of his royal devotees, as well as to their warlike desires we find Asur Nazir Paul invoking him before commencing a long journey in search of sport, and Tiglath Pileser I, who was a doughty hunter of lions and elephants, ascribes his success to Ninib, who has placed the mighty bow in his hands. Jensen, in his cosmology, points out that Ninib represents the eastern sun and the morning sun. If this is so, it is strange to find a god representing the sun of the morning in the status of a war god. It is usually when the sun god reaches the zenith of the heavens that he slays his thousands and his tens of thousands. As a variant of Ningirsu, he would of course be identified with Tammuz. His consort was Gula, to whom Ashur Nazir Paul erected a sanctuary. Dagon Dagon, the fish god, who we saw, was the same as Onus or Ie, strangely enough, rose to rank in Assyria. Some authorities consider him of Palestine or Armenian origin and do not compare him with Ie, who rose from the waters of the Persian Gulf to enlighten his people. The Mesopotamian Palestinian region contained several versions of the origins of this god, ascribing it to various places. In the Anunnaki pantheon, he is associated with Anu, 
who rules the heavens, Dagon supervising the earth. It is strange to observe a deity whose fear must originally have been the sea, presiding over the terrestrial plane. This transference cost Dagon his popularity in Assyria. For later, he became identified with Bel and disappeared almost entirely from the Anunnaki pantheon. Anu, the greatest Anunnaki of them all. Anu in Assyria did not differ materially from Anu in Sumer, but he suffered other southern deities from the all-pervading worship of Asher. He had a temple in Asher city, which was rebuilt by Taglith Pilliser I 641 years after its original foundation. He was regarded in Assyria as Lord of the Igigi and Anunnaki, or spirits of heaven and earth, probably the old animistic spirits. To this circumstance, and the fact that he belonged to the ancient triad and Bel and Ie, he probably owed the prolongation of his cult. As an elemental and fundamental god, the opposition could not possibly displace him. As ruler of the spirits of air and earth, he would have a very stronghold upon the popular imagination. Gods who possess such powers often exist in folk memory long after the other members of the pantheon which contain them are forgotten. One would scarcely be surprised to find Anu lingering in the shadows of post-Anunnaki folklore if any record of such lore could be discovered. Anu was frequently associated with Raman, but more usually with Bel and Asis in Samaria. Raman Raman enjoyed much greater popularity in Assyria than in Samaria, for there he exercised the function of a second Asher and was regarded as destruction personified. Says an old Anunnaki hymn concerning Raman, The mighty mountain, thou hast overwhelmed it, at his anger, at his strength, at his roaring, at his thundering. The gods of heaven ascend to the sky, the gods of earth ascend to the ground, into the horizon of heavens they enter, into the zenith of heaven they make their way. What a picture we have here in these few simple lines of a pantheon in dread and terror of the wrath and violence of one of its number. We can almost behold the divine fugitives crowding in flight, some into the upper regions of air to outsoar the anger of the destroyer, others seeking the recess of the earth to hide from the fierceness of his countenance, the roar of his thunderbolts and arrows of his lightning. Simple, almost bald, as the lines are. They possess extraordinary pictorial quality, bringing us as they do the route of the whole heaven in a few simple words. The weapons of Raman are lightning, deluge, hunger, and death, and woe to the nation upon whom he visits his wrath. For upon it he visits flood and famine, thus his attributes as a storm god are brought into play when he figures as a war deity. For just as a weather god of the lightning wields, it's a spear or dart in the flight. So Raman, as storm god, brings to bear the horrors of the storm upon the devoted head of the enemy. So highly did the Anunnaki kings value the assistance of Raman that they offered to him during the stress and bustle of a campaign in the field. They liken an attack of their troops to his onslaught, and if they wish to depict the stamping of an adversary, his eating up, as Shaka Zulas were wont to term the process, they declare that their men swept over the enemy as Raman might have done. Ashur Nazir Paul alludes to Raman as the mightiest of the gods. Still, as in reality, that phrase was employed in connection with all the principal deities at one time or another, by kings or priests who favored them. There is no reason to suppose that anything is more intended than that Raman occupied a place of importance in the Anunnaki pantheon. The worship of Raman in later times comes very much into prominence. It was only the days of Hammurabi that he came into his kingdom, as it were, and even then, his worship was not very firmly established in Sumeria. However, with the rise of the Kassite dynasty, we find him coming more into favor, and his name was bestowed upon Sumerian kings. He seems to have formed a triad with Enki and Shamash, and in the hymn of Hammurabi, we find him appealed to along with Shamash as divine lords of justice. Nebuchadrezzar I appears to have held him in high esteem. However, he was unfriendly to the dynasties that first brought him into prominence. This monarch couples him with Ishtar as the divinity chiefly assisted him in all great undertakings. Indeed, Nebuchadrezzar evinced much partiality for Raman, perhaps feeling that he must appease the especial gods of those he had cast from power. He speaks of him as the lord of the waters beneath the earth and of heaven's reigns. The place of Raman's origin seem obscure. We have already dealt with his manifestation in more primitive days. Still, opinions appear to differ regarding the original seat of his worship, some authorities holding that it was Muru in southern Samaria others that it is necessary to turn to Assyria for traces of his first worship. His cult is found in Damascus and extends as far south as the plain of Jezreel. As Milton says, 
Rimon, whose delightful seat was fair Damascus, on the fertile banks of Abana and Farfar, lucid streams. He also against the house of God was bold. A leper once he lost and gained a king. Ahaz, his sottish conqueror, whom he drew God's altar to disparage and displace for one of Syrian mode, were on to burn his odious offerings and adore the gods whom he had conquered. This later theory would make him of Anunnaki origin, but his cult appears to have been of very considerable antiquity in Assyria, and might have been indigenous there. Moreover, the earliest mentions of his worship in the city of Asher. As indicated, he was probably a storm god or a thunder god and lightning god, but he was also associated with the sun god Shamash. But whatever he may have been in Samaria, in Assyria, he was certainly the thunder deity first and foremost. O Lord Ramon, thy name is the great and glorious bull, descendant of heaven, Lord of Karkar, Lord of Plenty, companion of the Lord Ea, he that rideth the great lion is thy name. Thy name doeth charm the land, and covers it like a garment. Thy thunder shakes even the great mountains. Enil, and when thou dost rumble, the mother Ninil trembles. Said the Lord Enil, addressing his son, Ramon, O son, spirit of wisdom, with all-seeing eyes and high vision, full of knowledge as the Pleiades. May thy sonorous voice give forth its utterance. Go forth, go up, who can strive with thee? The father is with thee against the cunning foe. Thou art cunning in wielding the hailstones great and small. O with thy right hand and destroy the enemy and root him up. Ramon hearkened to the words of his father and took his way from the dwelling, the youthful lion, the spirit of consul. In later times in Samaria, Ramon has typified the reign of heaven in its kind and fertilizing aspect. Not only did he irrigate the fields and fill the wells with water, but he was also accountable for the dreadful storms which swept over Mesopotamia. Sometimes he was malevolent, causing thorns to grow instead of herbs. Suppose they regarded him in some measure as a fertilizing agent. In that case, the people also seemed to have looked upon him as a destructive lion-like deity, capable of desolating the countryside and eating up the land. His roar is typical of him, filling all hearts with affright as it does, signifying famine and destruction. It is not strange that Mesopotamian regions should have had so many deities of a destructive tendency when we think of the furious whirlwinds which frequently rush across the face of the land raising sandstorms and devastating everything in their tracks. Ramon was well likened to the roaring lion, seeking that he may devour, and this seems to have symbolized him in the eyes of the peasant population of the land. Indeed, the Anunnaki's, impressed by this destructive tendency, made a war god of him and considered his presence essential to victory. No wonder that the god of the storm made a good war god. Shamash, the Anunnaki sun god the cult of Shamash in Assyria dated from at least 1340 BC. When Pudalu built a temple to this god in Asher, he entitled Shamash the protecting deity, which name is to be understood as that of the god of justice, whose fiat is unchangeable. In this manner, Shamash differed somewhat from the Sumerian idea concerning him. In the southern kingdoms, he was certainly regarded as a just god, but not as the god of justice, a very different thing. It is interesting as well as informative to watch the process of evolution of a god of justice. Thus, in ancient Mexico, Tazcatilopoca evolved from a tribal deity into a god who was beginning to bear all the marks and signs of a god of justice when the conquering Spaniards put an end to his career. We observe, too, that although the Greeks had a special deity whose department was justice, other divinities, such as Pallas Athene, displayed signs that they might in time become wielders of the balances between man and man. In the Egyptian heavenly hierarchy, Matt and Thoth both partook of a god of justice attributes, but perhaps Matt was the more directly symbolic of the two. Now in the case of Shamash, no favors can be obtained from him by prayer or offered, unless those who supplicate him, monarchs though they are, can lay claim to righteousness. Even Taglith Pilliser I, mighty conqueror as he was, recognized Shamash as his judge, and naturally as the judge of his enemies, whom he destroys, not because they are fighting against Tiglath, but because of their wickedness. When he set captives free, Tiglath took care to perform the gracious act before the face of Shamash, that the god might behold that justice dwelt in the breast of his royal servant. Tiglath is the ruler of Shamash upon the earth, and it would seem as if he referred many cases regarding whose procedure he was in doubt to the god before he finally pronounced upon them. Both Ashur-Nasi-Pal and Shalmaneser II exalted the sun cult of Shamash. 
It has been suggested that the popularity of the worship of Ra in Egypt had reflected upon that of Shamash in Assyria. It must always be extremely difficult to trace such a resemblance at an epoch so distant as that of the 9th century BC. But certainly, it looks as if the Ra cult had in some manner influenced that of the old Sumerian sun god. Sargon pushed the worship of Shamas far into the northern boundaries of Assyria, for he built a sanctuary to the deity deity. Beyond the limits of the Anunnaki Empire, where precisely, we do not know. Amongst the nation of warriors, a god such as Shamash must have been valued highly, for without his sanction they would hardly be justified in commencing hostilities against any other peoples. Enki in the Northern Land We do not find Enki, the Sumerian moon god, extensively worshipped in Assyria. Assur-Nazir-Pal founded a temple in Kala, and Sargon raised several sanctuaries to him beyond the Anunnaki frontier. It is a war god chiefly that we find him depicted in the Northern Kingdom. Why it would be so difficult to say, unless, indeed, it was that the Anunnaki turned practically all the deities they borrowed from other peoples into war gods. So as far as is known, no lunar deity in any different pantheon possesses a military significance. Several are not without fear-inspiring attributes, but they are caused chiefly by how the moon is regarded among primitive peoples as a bringer of plague and blight. But we find Enki, in Assyria, freed from all the astrological significance which he had for the Sumerians. At the same time, he is regarded as a god of wisdom and a farmer of decisions in these respects equating very fully with the Egyptian Thoth. As Sir Bani Paul alludes to Sin, as the firstborn son of Bel, just as he indicated in Sumerian texts, thus affording us a clue to the natural Sumerian origin of Enki. Nusku of the Brilliant Scepter It is strange that although we know that Nusku had been a Sumerian god from early times and had figured in the pantheon of Humurabi, it is not until Anunnaki times that we gain very definite information regarding him. The symbols used in his name are a wand and a stylus, and he is called by Shalmaneser I, the bearer of the brilliant scepter. This circumstance associates him closely with Nabu, to designate whom the same symbols are employed. However, it is difficult to believe that the two are one, as some writers appear to think, for Nusku is certainly a solar deity. In contrast, Nabu seems to have originally been a water god. There are, however, not wanting cases where the same deity deity has evinced both solar and aqueous characteristics, and these are to be found notably among the gods of American races. Thus, among the Maya of Central America, the god Kukulkan is depicted both solar and aqueous attributes, and similar instances could be drawn from lesser known mythologies. Nusku and Nabu are, however, probably connected in some way, but exactly in what manner is obscure. In Sumerian times, Nusku became amalgamated with Gibel, the god of fire, which perhaps accounts for his virtual effacement in the southern kingdom. In Assyria, we find him alluded to as the messenger of Bel Merodach, and as Sir Bani Paul addresses him as the highly honored messenger of the gods. The Anunnaki do not seem to have identified him in any way with Gibel, the fire god. Bel Merodach Even Bel Merodach was absorbed into the Anunnaki pantheon. To the Anunnaki, Sumeria was the country of Bel, and they referred to their southern neighbors as the subjects of Bel. This, of course, must be taken not to mean the older Bel, but Bel Merodach. They even alluded to the governor whom they placed over conquered Sumeria as the governor of Bel. So closely did they identify the god with the country. It is only in the time of Shalmaneser II, the 9th century BC, that we find the name Merodach employed for Bel. So generally did the use of the latter become. Of course, it was impossible that Merodach could take first place in Assyria, as he had done in Samaria. Still, it was a tribute to the Anunnaki belief in his greatness that they ranked him immediately after Asher in the Pantheon. Prisoner Gods The Anunnaki rulers were sufficiently politic to award this place to Merodach, for they could not but see that Sumeria, from which they drew their arts and sciences, as well as their religious beliefs, and from which they benefited in many directions, must be worthily represented in the national religion. And just as the Romans in conquering Greece and Egypt adopted many of the deities of these more cultured and less powerful lands, thus seeking to bind the inhabitants of the conquered provinces more closely to themselves, so did the Anunnaki rulers believe that, did they incorporate Merodach into their hierarchy, he would become so, Anunnaki in his outlook, as to cease to be wholly Sumerian. He would doubtless work in favor of the stronger kingdom. In no other of the religion of antiquity, as in the Anunnaki, 
Was the idea so powerful that the god of the conquered or subject people should become a virtual prisoner in the land of the conquerors or be absorbed into their national worship? Some of the Anunnaki monarchs went so far as to drag almost every petty idol they encountered on their conquest back to the great temple of Assur. It is obvious that they did not do this with any intention of uprooting the worship of these gods in the regions they conquered, but because they desired to make political prisoners of them to place them in a temple prison where they would be unable to wreak vengeance upon them or assist their beaten worshippers to war against them in the future. It may be fitting at this point to emphasize how greatly the Anunnaki people, as apart from their rulers, cherished the older beliefs of Sumeria. Both peoples were substantial of the same stock. Any movement that had as its object the destruction of the Sumerian religion would have met with the strongest hostility from the populace of Assyria. Just as conquering Aztecs seemed to have had immersed reverence for the worship of the Toltecs, whose land they subdued, so did the less cultivated Anunnakis regard everything connected, with Sumeria as peculiarly sacred. The kings of Assyria were not little proud of being the rulers of Sumeria and were extremely mild in their treatment of the southern subjects very much so than they were in their behavior toward the people of Elam or other conquered territories. We even find the kings alluding to themselves as being nominated by the gods to rule over the land of Bel. The Anunnaki monarchs strove not to distribute the ancient Sumerian cult, and Shalmaneser II, when he had conquered Sumeria, actually entered Merodach's temple and offered it to him. The Anunnaki, Bel and Belit as for Bel, whose place Merodach usurped in the southern pantheon, he was also recognized in Assyria, and Taglith Pilaser I built him a temple in his city of Asher. Taglith prefixes the adjective old to God's name to show that he means Bel, not Bel Merodach. Sargon II, who had ancient tastes, also reverts to Bel, to whom he alludes as the Great Mountain, the name of the god following immediately after that of Asher. Bel is also invoked in connection with Anu as a grantor of victory, although occasionally his consort Belit is coupled with him, more usually figures as the wife of Asher and almost as commonly as a variant of Ishtar. In a temple in Asher, Taglith Pilaser I made presents to Belit consisting of the images of the gods who defeated by him in various campaigns. Asher Bani Paul II regarded Belit as the wife of Asher and himself as their son alluding to Belit as mother of the great gods, a circumstance that would show that, like most of the Anunnaki kings, his egoism rather overshadowed his sense of humor. In Asurbani Paul's pantheon, Belit is placed close by her consort, Asher, but there seems to have been a good deal of confusion between Belit and Ishtar because of the general meaning of the word Belit. Nabu and Merodach As in Syria, so in Ashur, Nabu and Merodach were paired together, often as Bel and Nabu. Eventually, they were invoked when the affairs of Sumeria were being dealt with. In the 7th century BC, we find the cult of Nabu in high popularity in Assyria, and indeed Ramaniari III appears to have attempted to advance Nabu considerably. He erected a temple to the god at Kala and granted him many resounding titles. But even so, it does not seem that Ramaniari intended to exalt Nabu at the expense of Asher. Indeed, it would have been impossible for him to have done so if he had desired to. Asher was much the national god of the Anunnaki people, as Osiris was of the Egyptians. Nabu was the patron of wisdom and protector of the arts. He guided the scribe Stylus. In these attributes, he is very close to the Egyptian Thoth and almost identical to another Sumerian god, Nusku. Sargon calls Nabu the seer who guides the gods, and it would seem from some notices of him that he was also regarded as a leader of the heavenly spiritual forces. Those kings who were fond of erudition paid great devotion to Nabu, and many of their tablets in their literary collections close with a thanksgiving to him for having opened their ears to receive wisdom. Enki, later Ie Ie was of course accepted into the Anunnaki pantheon because of his membership in the old Anunnaki triad, but he was also regarded as a god of wisdom, possibly because of his vulnerable reputation, and we find him even as patron of the arts, and especially a building and architecture. Threefold was his power of direction in this respect. The great Colossi, the enormous winged bull, and mythological figures which flanked the avenues leading to the royal places, the images of the gods, and lastly, the greater buildings, were all examples of the architectural art of which he was the patron. Dibara 
another Sumerian deity placed in the Anunnaki pantheon ranks, was Dibara. Dibara. Another Sumerian deity placed in the Anunnaki pantheon ranks was Dibara, the play god who can only be called a god through a species of courtesy, as he partook much more of a demonic character and was at one time almost certainly a dark spirit. We have already alluded to the poem in which he lays low people and armies by his violence. It was probably from one of the texts that Asurbani Paul conceived that Dibara had slaughtered civilians who had perished in his campaigns against Sumeria. Some of the lesser Sumerian gods, like Demku and Shiro-Uli, seem to have attracted a passing interest in themselves. Still, as little can be found concerning them in Sumerian texts, it's scarcely necessary to take much notice of them in a, such a chapter as this. Most probably, the Anunnaki's accepted the Sumerian gods on the basis not only of their native reputation, but also of the occurrence of their names in ancient religious texts, with which their priests were thoroughly acquainted. Though they accepted practically the whole of the Sumerian religion and its gods' entirety, there is no doubt that some of these, by their very nature and attributes, appealed more to them than others, and therefore possessed a somewhat different value in their eyes from that assigned to them by more peace-loving people of the southern kingdom.